Robert Chadwick. I'd like to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Chadwick and I uh, just recently visited uh, India, and he was one of the keynote speakers at a conference. It was the second National Teachers Congress in Pune, India, and he gave a presentation on dinosaurs. And so I don't want you to share that presentation right now because you have another task to do. But if you want to ask Dr. Chadwick about his experience in India, I'm sure he would be happy to share that with you. We had a great time, didn't we? We did. All right. Thanks. Dr. Brand and I go back a long ways. He was a, a student at La Sierra a couple of years ahead of me. And uh, after, subsequent to that, he went to Loma Linda University where he got a master's degree. And then he took off to Cornell University for his PhD, where he got a PhD in animal behavior. After that, he came back to Loma Linda, and he and myself and Dr. Bernie Newfeld all were there at about the same time. And it wasn't very long until Leonard was chairman of the department. He has chaired the department there for, through many, many difficulties over many, many years until uh, just two years ago or three years. three years ago when he passed the baton to our own Susie Phillips, who has uh, taken over as chairman of the department. Dr. Brand and I have been doing research for over 20 years together and on a lot of different topics. And it's a real pleasure to have him here today to talk to us about some of the issues in his heart. By the way, um, he added me as a co-author on his textbook, which just came out in the third edition, Faith, Reason, and Earth History. And you can get a copy of that off the internet for free. You can download a PDF file or you can buy one on Amazon for $50. Uh, which we get no, none of the funds from. But anyway, uh, Dr. Brand. We're, we're here as some Adventists to tell about Jesus Christ. Amen. That's our message. So, so why am I talking about science here? Well, the Jesus I know... He's not only interested in getting us to heaven, he, he, he even will help scientists understand what they're doing. <clears throat> and that's important, partly at least, because the way a lot of science goes, it can, it can confuse a person. <clears throat> so um, I want to talk about how Genesis can be an asset to science. And he's led me in an in interesting life. <clears throat> um, started out life as a biologist, uh, evolved. Uh, retrained in geology, and so that's been a, a, an interesting journey um, and has been very helpful, actually. So we, um, we have all kinds of things we talk about and try to understand. The other day, uh, a friend came in to my office and looked at this fossil that's on my wall and, and wondered how, you know, how we could think that this didn't take uh, millions of years. Well, he had some things to learn about how you how fossils get formed. But anyway, that's an issue that, the kind of issue that comes up. The Grand Canyon, people will stand at the rim of the Grand Canyon and, and ponder, you know, how long must this have taken? Um, there are a lot of things to, to learn about that, and uh, a lot of things we wouldn't intuitively know. Um, here we have, this is awful loud, is, uh, I don't know if that's sounding okay. Um, three different shots across Utah. Um, this is the Navajo sandstone. It, go, it goes across southern Utah, way over to Zion Park over here. Uh, how do you form one layer like that? Uh, how, does, how does sand get deposited now? Well, often by rivers. Okay, does that, does that look... How do you understand that? That's an issue that's interesting and worthwhile of studying. Here's, here are three formation, rock formations, one, actually several three cliffs, one above the other. Each one covers hundreds of miles, and so we it's we like to understand how this happens. <clears throat> Do processes that we know produce that kind of thing? So, <clears throat> let's talk about science and how we approach some of these questions. 
the goal of science, to discover facts about our world. Now, what does the book Genesis do? One of the things that it does is tells us, God tells us the facts about origins. Now, is this, is, does science like this kind of connection? Um, usually not. Uh, one is, is using human wisdom. The other, we're, we're looking to divine wisdom to give us understanding. And so how do, the, how do those fit together? Uh, this is generally seen as a, as a severe conflict. How can you think you can do science when you're, uh, you're letting God tell you what's what? <clears throat> is there a way we can turn this into mutual support? And that's what I want to talk about today. How about this, this conflict or this mutual support? So we have to begin with foundations. What is the foundation under which we, we work? Every project has a foundation, and they're very important. You build a house, you make a foundation out of concrete, and then you can build on that foundation. <clears throat> In science, the foundation is a little more ethereal. Our, our foundation is ideas, assumptions, worldviews, and we build on those foundations. And so we have two different foundations, human wisdom alone, naturalism. The, the philosophy of naturalism, or uh, methodological naturalism, which is the aspect that we're most interested in here, that's a, a worldview that says there is no, we do not consider the possibility of a creator. Uh, we do not take advice from any divine book. Uh, we never allow supernatural explanations for anything in science. That's methodological naturalism. That's one foundation. The other foundation, if we're going to build on divine wisdom, that begins with creation, the fall, and a global flood, all within a fairly short time. So those are pretty divergent uh, foundations. <clears throat> so what can we do with it? The conflict, is that, th there certainly is a conflict in the foundation. Is that the basic conflict, or does it go broader than that? What, what is this, this conflict all about? Is there a possibility of using either of these foundations as a platform on which to build the scientific process? Or is only one of them going to work? Um, I read a lot of anti-creation books and articles, and it's pretty clear uh, what they have to say. Well, uh, a, 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 um, a believer in God who's going to use that in how he thinks is not going to get anywhere in science. That's the point of view. Uh, it's also evident, well, I'll come back to this. <clears throat> a bit. Okay, so we have this comparison, these two foundations, but something is missing in this comparison. We've just begun to make that comparison. And what's missing is it doesn't describe what we build on the foundation, and that's where the key is to understand all of this. What do we build on the foundation? <clears throat> okay, conventional science. That's uh, one way to describe just the way most scientists see things. Uh, the foundation, of course, is methodological naturalism, does not allow any supernatural explanations for anything in science. But the procedure is important to understand. We ask questions, we do, exper do experiments or make observations, we use logic, and we come to an interpretation. So that's, this is the foundation. Here we have the procedure that we use on that foundation. Okay. Um, here we have our two foundations. How, what kind of procedures do we use with the second one? Well, we ask questions. We develop hypotheses. We do experiments or observations. We use logic and we reach an interpretation. The procedure has to be the same. The questions may be very different, but we have to, if we're going to do science, we can, I can just say, well, okay, I, I believe God knows what he's talking about when he says there was a global flood and this happens shortly. But if I want to then address that with science, which is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, then I need to follow these procedures. There isn't a special procedure that a Christian uses if he's doing science. So expand a little bit on this. <clears throat> the human wisdom, the naturalistic approach. In biology, um, this will lead you to origin of all life by evolution, random mutations, and natural selection, gradual improvement over millions of years. Okay, this one, um, creation, fall, global flood. In biology, 
we would say here life was created perfect. And then there was adaptation. There was microevolution, adaptation, new species. Um, and also decline. Mutations have been a, a great burden uh, through the centuries. Um, and so there is adaptation, but there is also decline. Um, in geology, if we're using our, our divine foundation, ancient history we would see is more catastrophic. There is a short time since the Cambrian. The modern world is different. The geologist Lyell wrote a couple of books to set geology on a certain course, saying there is no catastrophe. Well, that was dogma for a century. It finally got at least partly revised, um, recognized that, yeah, catastrophes do happen. But still, uh, if you're working in this system, you do not let those catastrophes reduce the amount of time for evolution. But here, if we're working uh, with the Bible as a foundation, there is a short time. The modern world is different. It is not the same as what happened in the ancient past. And we suggest the creation story is, in fact, a true foundation on which we can build. So um, how about that? What difference does the foundation make for science. Yeah, I'm describing these two foundations, but uh, does it really matter for science? Depends on what we're doing. I, I've, I've uh, simplified a little bit here, but you can divide science more or less into things we do, studying things that happen right now. How do, how do the cells in our biology work? How do all those processes work? How does our physiology work? You can, it's working, it's happening right in front of us, we can do our experiments over and over and see how it works. History, ancient history, that's a little different. Uh, sure, we can study how rivers deposit sediments, but is that really the way this was deposited? We're, we're asking about events from the distant past, about processes in the distant past, which we can't go back and observe. And so there is a difference. And the foundation, whether the foundation matters, uh, is affected by what we do. <coughs> So if we're studying ongoing processes, either foundation will work. Uh, you can use either of these. Now, I would suggest the methodological naturalism is not necessary, and maybe even gets in the way. But even if you believe it, it'll work, because you're studying what happens right now, and you can observe and figure out and correct your errors. <clears throat> so things like biochemistry, physiology, uh, a lot of parts of physics, um, and much, a lot more. You're studying things that you can test right now in front of you. Ancient history origin. The question of conflict or mutual support is most pertinent when we're studying ancient history origins. We cannot go back and see what happens. Um, we have not yet invented a time machine. And so we do our best, and it's a fascinating area of study. But th there are limitations in what we can do. And this question of, of our foundation, um, is, is most important when we're studying what happened in the distant past. <clears throat> okay, so how, what difference does it make? Well, conventional science has a handicap because it's working with what I would describe as an uncertain foundation, the worldview of methodological naturalism. I would say maybe even worse than, than um, uncertain, but that's, that's my view. Uh, on, on somewhere between uncertain and false worldview. And could that mislead a person? I think so. <clears throat> Science founded on Genesis has an advantage. I, dis I suggest to you that we're building, in this case, on a true foundation. A correct worldview starts with creation and the things that follow that. And if we have a, if we indeed, if I'm correct, if we have a, a more sure foundation, we should be able to find better answers. This is not the way um, most scientists see it. <clears throat> but on the other hand, I, I read a lot on the anti-creationist literature, and they, the people who write this obviously have hardly a clue how, to, how an educated creationist thinks, or what our point of view is. They really don't, don't uh, know. Whereas we have another advantage, people like Chadwick and myself and a lot of others, you, you can't do science the way we do and not understand the other side, and not understand how conventional scientists think and what they're working with, what the data they're working with. We understand both points of view. If you, if you want to convince somebody that 
Toyotas are better than Fords, but you've never driven a Toyota, are you going to be very successful? If, if you understand both, you can, think about and you can think about and compare them, and we do. We all the time are thinking about these two points of view and trying to see where can we find something we can test. <coughs> and that is an advantage. Uh, even, if, even if I was wrong in thinking that Genesis is a more correct creation foundation, the fact that we look at different points of view and compare and, and contrast and look for ways to test is a distinct advantage. <coughs> so up here we have a conflict between the foundation and uh, the, the science. Here we have mutual support. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. Up here we have conflict with the Bible, but comfort with scholarly society. Uh, down here we're working with, under, with Genesis. We have mutual, <coughs> excuse me, mutual support with the Bible, but conflict with scholarly society. And we, uh, you never really forget about this if you're doing this kind of work. So let's talk about this, this advantage that I'm claiming. A more accurate foundation can result in better questions and hypotheses. This is my, my, what I'm suggesting is right. So I'm going to try to explain whether or not that's true. OK, the answers. <coughs> um, to, to, if we're going to, OK, we've got the questions up here. The questions can come from any, from any worldview. Any worldview can help you to ask questions. Uh, and the questions can, uh, you know, it doesn't, philosophers have, have never been able to show that there is an objective way to define how a scientist gets questions, the hypotheses. Those can come from anywhere. The question is, the, the important thing is, what do you do with them? So the answers, how do you get your answers? Okay, to answer the questions, to test the hypotheses, requires normal scientific procedures. So that's where we, we are on the same basis with anybody else. We, ha we, use, we have to use the scientific procedures that anybody can use. We may come up, sometimes we do come up with better procedures, but they have to be procedures that anybody can use. Anybody can repeat what we do. And if we, do, if we have that, then we are doing science that cannot legitimately be, be um, challenged. And of course, if we come to wrong conclusions, that can be challenged. But... Uh, <coughs> OK, so I've described this way of thinking. Does that really work? Uh, I'm saying that Genesis can indeed be an asset to science because it helps us to think more broadly and think of better questions, new questions. Does it actually work? Yes. And I could give, if I, you know, you probably want to leave here before midnight, so I won't be able to give as many examples as I'd like to. But <coughs> yes, it does work. Um, in biology, um, the origin of life is basically a, a disaster if you try to do it without a creator from, from the evidence. And the evidence is increasingly uh, in that direction. Macroevolution, you read the, the evolutionary biology texts and it looks like this is a clear-cut thing. We know how that happens. But if you look at what's, being ha what's happening in modern uh, feels like genetics and molecular biology, where there's a, it's exploding in new procedures and new ways of understanding. Uh, even molecular biologists who, who are not creationists come right out and say Darwinism does not work. Random mutations in natural selection cannot do anything of a significance. So this is running into more and more problems. <coughs> Geology is, is more complicated. Like you say, we're studying the past, and it's not so easy to get real good, um, you know, real solid results, <coughs> understandings. But there are many examples I can give. I'm going to go through one example, a study of fossil whales in Peru, to illustrate the things that I'm, I'm uh, talking about. OK, this is a study, taphonomy of fossil whales in Peru, by my, led by myself and Dr. Arthur Chadwick here from Southwestern, uh, with a number of colleagues <coughs> who helped us. Taphonomy is a word you may not have heard of. Uh, you can do taphonomy research yourself. If you find a dead cat on the road, kick it in the ditch and go every day and take notes on what's happening. Uh, how long does it take for the flesh to be destroyed? How long does it take for the bones to fall apart? Taphonomy is a study of how uh, fossils form, the process from death to fossilization to the time when we find the fossil. 
It's all those processes. <coughs> and that's been a, um, a strong area of research um, since about the 60s. So here in Peru, we, we visited down there, and we were giving some lectures, and somebody said, do you want to see some fossil whales? Well, naturally, we said, sure. When, when, a, when a theologian asks you if you want to see some fossils, you, you never know what you're going to see. Um, but these were indeed whales, beautiful fossil whales. And so we realized some research was needed, so we began uh, studying these. <coughs> the Pisco Formation is the, the formation that had the, had the whales and a lot of other vertebrates, but we focused on the whales. Um, it's these, these layers of, of sandstone and siltstone and, and diatoms, diatomaceous deposits. And we're, these layers used to go all the way over to the Andes. A lot of it has eroded out um, since it was, after it was formed. This is a, a, a coastal plain, uh, goes from the ocean to the Andes Mountains. And this was formed <coughs> under, under shallow water, shallow ocean bays, uh, and has raised up since. And so <coughs> we're looking here again from the, the, the Pisco Formation to the Andes. And the whales used to go all the way from here to there. Um, these green, the green part here is the Pisco Formation, and it goes 200 kilometers uh, along the, co the coast. Here are the Andes Mountains over there. Our main study area started right up here, and then we, we studied uh, down quite a ways south as well. Uh, if for those of you who understand, ge who are familiar with the geologic column, this uh, Pisco Formation is up here between the Miocene and the Pliocene. So it's later in the fossil record. Um, in my way of thinking, it's probably after the main event of the flood. It's, uh, the area is the driest desert in the world, the Atacama Desert. It's actually very beautiful in a certain way. Biologists, um, I mean, geologists appreciate an area that doesn't have all those green things covering the rocks and fossils. And there are no green things down here. There is no rain. I've seen an official figure of one millimeter per year. Uh, I was in one of their big rainstorms. There was, there was um, rainbow, and there was wind, and ev everything. And I felt, I think, a couple dozen drops of rain. So that's a, a Atacama rainstorm. <coughs> uh, there's one plant you find occasionally up on the higher hills. I don't recall what they call this, but it's a unique plant. You can, you know, it's, if you're hiking on a trail and you see a turtle, you can pick it up and look at it and put it down. Well, you don't usually do that with plants. But this plant, you can pick it up, examine it, and put it back down. There are no roots. There's no use having roots. There's no water in the soil. There, the higher hills get a, a mist that comes in in the morning, kind of like the Garden of Eden, and it waters them, and that's how they grow. But the rest of it is, just doesn't have any of that green stuff. <coughs> You, if when we camp, you camp wherever you can find a place. Uh, it doesn't matter much. This is our, our most luxurious campsite because of the hill that kind of made it interesting. We call this the Brujita Hilton. Um, this, hi this mountain was Brujita. And uh, <coughs> this is a Peruvian colleague. I could tell you a lot of stories about Mario. He became a dear friend. And there are the, the fossils are amazing and abundant. Uh, a lot of sharks. Uh, this was probably from one shark mouth. Uh, there, there are shark teeth as big as your hand. Uh, this is a complete skeleton, and you, you realize that sharks don't have bones. This is all cartilage, and yet we have a complete skeleton. It had to have been buried very fast to, to be preserved. <coughs> dolphins, uh, quite a few dolphins, beautiful specimen. This one would have brought 10,000 on the black market, and we, that was one of the problems of studying fossils down there. Penguins, beautiful penguins. There are even fossil um, ground sloths, which they think were, were semi-aquatic. And there's a turtle the size of a Volkswagen, and some of the bones show pathology, so there were interesting conditions. But the whales were, was our, our uh, subject. Now, a whale skeleton has a, have a very large skull, and then, of course, the, the backbone, the vertebrae, the rib cage, and front limbs. <coughs> And the whales we studied were mostly related to the fin whale, the sai whale, and the blue whale. They're different species, but the same, uh, same group, Balanoptera most likely. And they're, they're amazing. Uh, some, some of them quite large, uh, very well preserved. 
Um, they're often quite beat up by just modern erosion that, that tears them up. But this one is, is all there. The skull is there, the, the backbone, the limbs are here falling apart, and the ribs are in there. Here's another one. This is kind of typical of what you see out there in the desert. It's been partly covered with sand. But there's a complete whale. And one more skull up here and uh, the, the rest of the whale. So we measured and described and photographed and we determined where everyone was found. <coughs> Dr. Shadwick had begun using his uh, GPS equipment here in the dino dig. And so we used that to determine the location of every whale. His, his uh, three, three millimeter uh, variation range was a little more accurate than we needed, but that's the equipment we had. Um, and it worked very well. We were able to locate every whale. And there were a lot of whales. This is one of our main study areas. And this is roughly a square mile. It's a, it's a hill. This is an aerial photograph we took uh, of this area. And we plotted all the whales. These lines are, are layers of sediment that go through the hill. And this is where you see them along the edge. And there's about 360 whales here. <coughs> now you see it says they've divided them into complete whales and partial whales. The, the partial whales really are because of modern erosion that has damaged them. But the evidence indicates they're pretty much all complete, uh, well-preserved whales. <coughs> And this is only one square mile. This whole formation goes 200 kilometers. So you uh, try to calculate the number of whales there. And here's a picture of that same hill from the side with these different layers of sediment and the, the number of whales per square kilometer. You notice in the upper layers, it goes up to about 350 whales per square kilometer. That's a, a, a whale of a lot of whales. <laughs> and <coughs> okay, here's the same graph, but showing each individual whale that we found. So there are plenty of things to study. And most of the ones in this area are in, are in um, deposits of diatoms. Now diatoms are microscopic little organisms, uh, live in the water, they, they die and sink to the bottom. Uh, and usually in, in the modern world, in the ocean this happens, they sink to the bottom and they mostly dissolve. But look at our diatoms, they're beautifully preserved. Uh, this, this is our pictures through a scanning electron microscope. They are tiny little uh, delicate things. Okay, so we've, we learned quickly that the accepted scenario is that the sediment deposits a few centimeters each thousand years. That's what happens in the oceans today. And so geologists tend to use the modern world and explain the past by the modern world. Okay, and so the assumption was this is the way it happened here, a few centimeters per thousand years. But the data here that we study was that the whales are beautifully preserved. <clears throat> okay, a whale, say he's this thick, how many thousands of years is it going to take to bury him? Uh, several tens of thousands of years. Well, is that realistic? What happens in the modern world? If we use the modern world to understand the past, we have to look at the whole picture. So the questions we asked, how fast were the sediment and whales deposited? This had been studied for at least 20 years before by geologists and paleontologists, and they all apparently felt they understood how long this all took and how it happened. Uh, you have a uniform explanation given in the literature. <coughs> but <coughs> we asked further, can such slow burial preserve complete whales? And our hypothesis is that the whales were buried much faster. Something is wrong with the, the scenario that has been in the literature at that point. So what happens in the modern world? And there are people who study this. Whales off the California coast die, they sink, and they take these submersibles down and study them. Okay, when a whale dies, think of how much food that is. Thousands of organisms descend on that whale. And <coughs> within, within perhaps a maximum of six months, it's like this. The flesh is gone. And then the next crew comes in that begins to, to burrow, uh, to uh, chew on the bones. And pretty soon they look like this, and in a few years, the bones are gone. All right, so <clears throat> how do we fit this together? Beautifully preserved whales that would take tens of thousands of years to bury, but the modern world, a whale doesn't last more than a few years at, for, for the whole thing until it's gone. And you, you, 
even if it's a much shorter time than that, the bones will be, will be have holes where the creatures have chewed into the bones. But here we have beautiful whale. The bones are, are intact. They've not been burrowed by organisms. They've not been uh, chewed on. Um, and even baleen, you know the baleen in a whale's mouth, this, the sieve that they f get their food with, that's not bone, that, that's uh, like fingernails. And it, when whales die, it falls out pretty quick. But here we have baleen right in there, and it, it looks like this. Um, it's either the, the, the sediment between the baleen plates or even the plates themselves are preserved. And many of the whales here have that, have the baleen in them. Um, our crew published a paper uh, on baleen and fossil whales. Up to that point, there'd been maybe a half a dozen examples of fossil baleen in, in the museums in North America. In our paper, we described 31 cases of baleen right here, and there have been many more discovered since then. Something is unique about, how the, about these whales. They had to have been buried very fast. And the, and the diatoms, like I said, the modern world, the diatoms dissolve. By the time it gets to the bottom and gets buried, uh, one, or one to two percent of the baleen of the diatom actually gets preserved. Our diatoms are, are beautiful. They're exquisitely preserved. Something is very different. It, it could not have taken tens of <coughs> excuse me, tens of thousands of years. Okay, so here we have this conflict. Sediment, a few centimeters, thousand years, well-preserved whales and diatoms, and here's one of our favorites. We could all get here with this whale and take a picture and uh, show the whale that we found. Um, but it, you have a complete mouth of baleen, just like you have here, and the rest of the whale goes on back. And this is, this place is just amazing. Here's one whale, here's another whale, there's another one. Uh, you know, they're just all over the place. <coughs> so we have the sediment deposited slowly, well-preserved whales and diatoms. How can this be? Um, how can it, how can those two fit together? Um, okay, and just to look a little more closely at some of these whales. This one we called Carmen. Uh, Carmen, when we first found it, this was the only part exposed on the surface, and it's kind of falling apart. But you dig back into the hill, the bones are all there, and they are complete. They are, they are exquisitely preserved. And when I say all there, there is an exception. We find, uh, commonly find shark teeth uh, associated with the whales, some as big as your hand. And uh, we think that's probably what happened here. One flipper is complete and beautiful. One flipper is gone uh, completely. Um, perhaps a shark had something to do with that. Here's another one. Just, uh, it's, it's really amazingly complete and beautiful. This is a, <coughs> a little one, only about two meters long, two yards long. Um, but it's all there and beautifully preserved. And it has baleen right in here. Uh, beautiful baleen deposit. And look at something else. You see this orange color. Okay, the diatomite doesn't have this color. It's sort of whitish. This is the normal color. You only find this color associated with a fossil. And what that tells us is that when this, when this creature was buried, there still was, was tissue. There was tissue, un, undecayed tissue there. And the decay of that tissue sets up a, a chemical reaction, and that's what produces this color. And so this, this guy was buried still having his flesh. Uh, at least some of the flesh was still there. <coughs> Here's another whale that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's the skull and the body. The, the, the skeleton is complete. But how do you take a whale, this, this huge whale, and squeeze it into an S-curve like this? Well tells us one thing, that the bones are all beautifully intact, but there must have, the scavengers must have taken off much of the flesh so that it could bend uh, in, in this kind of a, a shape. Okay, here's another bone. It's just close up. You can see the bones are, are intact. They have not been torn apart, burrowed. And here's a, something very interesting. This is a slab of baleen. In this whale, that slab of baleen came out of the mouth and drifted over and landed on the flipper. All right, so we'll look more closely at that one in just a minute. This is the whale it came from. We call this one um, Fernanda. 
uh, my student, Raul, uh, wrote back to his wife and said, we're naming whales after people we know. She said, you better not name one after me. <laughs> but we didn't know anybody named Fernanda, so we called this Fernanda. And Fernanda is complete, except for a couple of the final verts, tail vertebrae, beautifully preserved. And this is that slab of baleen that I showed you just a minute ago. <clears throat> and, okay, this next picture here is taken right at the side of one of these vertebrae. We, we made kind of a trench across it to see what the sediment was like. And so here's that picture. This is the side of the vertebra. And here you have the, the layers of, of uh, diatomaceous material, diatomaceous sediment. And look at this orange color. Okay, this still had flesh on it when it was buried. And the decay of that flesh um, made this discoloration because of the chemical reactions that take place there. And something else with that whale. Here's, here's Fernanda again. We took out one vertebra, cut it in two, and this is where the spinal cord goes. Okay, and the spinal cord, I don't know if you've ever, ever dissected an animal and see what the spinal cord is like. That's really, really soft, almost mushy tissue. But this black material is heavy minerals which were deposited there because of decay of that tissue. So the spinal cord was still intact when he was buried. This, re this all requires very, very rapid burial. Uh, centimeters per 1,000 years, there's just no way. It was buried very rapidly. <coughs> here's that slab of baleen I showed you. Okay, this is the, the surface, and here's a cross-section. These dark layers are the, the plates of baleen. The white material is, is the diatomaceous uh, sediment. And here we're seeing the surface of one of these plates. And <coughs> this here it is in our... <coughs> microscope. I sent this to a molecular uh, paleontologist who identified that this is indeed protein. This is soft material. It's protein. And this whale should have been at least 13 million years old. Protein doesn't last anywhere near that long. And here's a, a electron micrograph of that, of that uh, baleen. It's multiple layers of, of uh, sort of fibrous material in uh, alternate directions. Exquisitely preserved. That did not lay around for, for thousands of years, even for years, or even months, probably. It was buried uh, and, and preserved very rapidly. Something happens, though, when, as they sink. These, these creatures were not beached. They, they sank in shallow bays. Okay, so they died, and we'll talk about why in a minute. They would die, and they would sink. And I suggest this one sank kind of like the Titanic. You know, you've seen pictures of the Titanic. Titanic. It was, it was sinking, it broke apart in two pieces and sank. Well, this guy broke apart right behind his head. And the skull has, is moved back and is sitting on top of about half of the rib cage. Okay, so how do you move a, a whale? You know how big a whale is. How do you move a whale's skull back and set it on top of the rib cage? Well, it must have moved as it was settling down in the water. I don't think any current would move that thing. And so they, they sink down and like this. Here's another one. It's a complete whale. But again, he broke apart in a couple, in a couple of places. Here are his neck vertebrae, but they've been turned around backwards. And so again, parts of this whale sank uh, as he was, and as he was coming down, things were moving around a little bit. And now we'll look at that same whale. Here's that same whale, and his skull is right here. So again, that... He broke apart, and the, it, the parts moved as he was settling down, and so they were, did not come down exactly in, in the right place. But the whale is complete. His bones are, have not been chewed on. They are, they are, not, they are exquisitely preserved. <coughs> okay, so what's really going on here? Well, you, 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 must, you obviously had a huge amount of diatoms and other plankton in the water. Okay, and when you, the, you have these blooms, you heard of red tides, where the, the plankton you gets, uh, for some reason, it just multiplies rap tremendously, it makes these red tides. Well, when that happens, you can get these planktonic blooms. Um, sometimes some of it they call marine snow. And here's some marine snow. This is diatoms um, forming this, this mass of stuff, marine snow. Okay, and there was just, this was very abundant when these whales were dying. Okay, so probable causes of death. Probably two things. There's a lot of volcanic ash in the sediment, 
Uh, this is the time when the Andes Mountains are coming up, and the Andes are, are volcanic. And so tremendous volcanic uh, eruptions and a lot of ash in the sediment. And breathing volcanic ash with all of its glassy little things is, is not good for your health, to say the least. But also, <coughs> you have these diatom blooms, red tides, and those have been demonstrated to be toxic. Here in California in 2000, there was an episode of a lot of sea lions killed. And they, they were able to determine that these were killed by, by, by toxins from diatom blooms. So these two factors uh, seem to be the reason why you have these whales dying in such numbers and why there's so much diatom material being deposited in these bays. And the, uh, say a little bit more about that, the, <coughs> the diatoms, we had those identified, they, uh, they are not from shallow water diatoms. They're from deep water diatoms. And so it seems evident that you had these whales gathering uh, for there was so much plankton and uh, not things bigger than diatoms, things the whales were eating. They were gathering out there offshore. Um, there, was hu there were huge uh, diatom uh, blooms because of the, the uh, volcanic ash, which has elements that the, whale, that the diatoms need. Uh, and there are other things that influence this. And then we have evidence also in the sediments that there were, there were uh, storms, storm currents that were bringing all this stuff in and accumulating it in these bays. That's why you have so many whales and so much diatom material. So that's why they died and why they got accumulated. <coughs> so summary of our evidence, complete whales, bones in pristine condition, baleen preserved, and the diatoms in pristine condition. So how did this happen? Slow deposition. Um, there is a definite conflict here between the evidence and the theory. They just don't, do not fit. And so we can ask, why did no one else notice this? OK, well here we've got a bunch of creationists come down to doing uh, geology research, paleontology research. Why did we notice it? Why did the others who have been studying this for 20 years not notice it? Your worldview has a lot of influence on what questions you ask, what questions you're willing to consider, and what explanations you're willing to consider. And I would say we have a, we have a worldview issue here. We came with an understanding of both worldviews and asking, uh, which, which opened our eyes to think of new questions, which others would not likely uh, think of because they think they already know how long it took to deposit this. And so we asked new questions. We noticed what other people had not noticed, or at least had not published. Um, there was one indication that somebody asked, you know, is this, does this work? But nothing further went from there. But we, uh, we uh, studied it carefully. A false worldview can lead to false conclusions. It can blind us to conflicts between the evidence and the interpretations. And there are many examples of this. The, the conflict in going on right now between molecular biologists and evolutionary biologists is one example. The molecular biologists know that the Darwinian theory cannot work. Random mutations cannot work. Yet the molecular biologists don't know what to do with that. We would suggest, well, it's because uh, they, these things did not evolve um, on a macro scale. So a false worldview can lead uh, to false conclusions. It can blind us to conflict between the evidence and the interpretation. Comparing different hypotheses or worldviews gives a broader base for asking questions and for interpreting the evidence. And you, you one's mind is open. Uh, uh, you know, the, the evidence didn't have to say these were buried rapidly. We had to look at all possibilities. But the evidence, in fact, did say this has to be rapid. And, and our minds were willing to consider that option whereas many others were not. So <clears throat> a true worldview, I suggest, gives an advantage. It opens our minds to notice conflicts in data interpretation. It, it encourages asking new questions, suggests new hypotheses. OK, the Bible does not give us new scientific procedures. I haven't read anything in my Bible about how to study taphonomy and how to interpret the rocks. It doesn't give us that. We must address our new questions and hypotheses with standard scientific procedures, procedures that others can use. So here's the difference between the questions, 
which can be really wild, come from anywhere. How you answer the question must be done in a way that other people could repeat your work and, and find if, you're, if you've done it right. And so that's, that's why this can all work. We can ask wild questions, at least what would be considered wild to other people. But we have to answer the questions in ways um, that can be understood and can be repeated by others. And when we do that, we find interesting, very interesting results. And it works. Uh, this is our first publication. Um, we could see that, and there's there some interesting experiences that went along with this. We could see that the evidence just didn't fit this very slow deposition. It had to be rapid. And <coughs> we, we wrote up a, a manuscript addressing that specific question. And before we submitted it to a journal, I wanted to get more input from other scientists. And so uh, Raul, a student, was able to discuss this with diatom experts here in Texas. And they, they looked at what we'd uh, had come up with, and they said, yeah, you, you, your data says you're, you're right, and you, of the several explanations we had, they, they were said, well, these won't work so well, but this is your important one, emphasize that. Okay, so we, we knew we're on the right track with the diatoms. Then <coughs> Raul and I went to a, a meeting in, in Spain, an international conference of taphonomists. This was not a big meeting, just maybe 150 people, all experts in this one field, and they had several world experts in taphonomy give talks. The rest of us had posters uh, showing our research. <coughs> and so, and Raul had came from Spain, and he knew the people planning this, and so he emailed and said, how big can our posters be? Well, he never got an answer. So we had the, the kind of posters we'll take to Geological Society of America meetings. We had two posters, about three and a half feet by seven feet. And so, Raul went early over there, and he, and he went to see the guy who he knew, who was in charge of posters, and he said, how big can the posters be? And the guy said, one meter square. <laughs> so Raul said, well, we're in trouble. <laughs> and so the, guy, the other guy said, well, show me what you've got. So Raul rolled, up, rolled out our two posters on the floor, and he said, oh, we'll definitely put those up. Uh, and, <clears throat> and the poster session, where people come and look at your posters and talk to you, there were two sessions, each an hour and a half. And he, he put us kind of down the hall where there was a bigger open space. So we had our two posters, and he said, keep yours up the whole time. <laughs> so we had, what, eight times as much space, twice as much time. Well, there were, there were two taphonomists we really were hoping we could talk to. They were two, two ladies who were uh, top of the game for, in taphonomies, taphonomies. And so we were down there at the poster session. The first hour and a half, there were a lot of people around our posters. Then they kind of drifted off to the other posters, and these two ladies came down. So we had an hour and a half with the two top taphonomists in the world. <laughs> and they liked our work. They said, your data supports your conclusions. And uh, <clears throat> one of them ended up being a reviewer on this paper, which is geology is the most prestigious journal in the field of geology. This is where you, you get kind of brief papers giving new, new breakthroughs, uh, new ideas. And so here's our whale on, on the cover. <coughs> and as I was writing this, this paper, the evidence said to me that each whale had to have been buried within weeks or months of the time of the day, at, you know, at the most. But I thought to myself, that'll never get published. They just, scientists just don't believe it happens that fast. So I, I softened a little bit. I said months to years. And this one reviewer who is, is can be argued as the, as the top taphonomist in the world. She's kind of the, I've heard her described as the mother goddess of taphonomy. Um, she's a good looking lady, very nice person. But anyway, she was one of the reviewers. And she, at that part, she said, well, your evidence says it has to be faster. It has to be days or weeks. And so I put it back in and got published. <laughs> so <coughs> I was delighted. Well, there are other papers, and there's another big one um, as well. The, level, the latest one we did was a pretty large manuscript on, on these fossil whales. And we submitted it to one journal. And they, they always send these to reviewers who uh, tell you what's wrong with your paper. One of the reviewers gave four pages of kind of nitpicking on the paper. But the last half page, he said, well, you know, this is interesting research. But you guys are well-known young earth creationists, and we can't trust you. 
and he told the journal not to publish it, which they didn't. But we submitted it to another journal, um, and that journal published it, and the editor said, we think this is going to be a very important paper. So you don't give up. You keep finding ways to get this published. And you have to use judgment. Um, you know, we, we didn't say in this paper, now this shows that the geologic record has to happen very fast. I mean, we've just been shot out of the water. You, you, you carefully stay with your, with your evidence. You don't go beyond what you can really show with your evidence. And you have to, be, you have to use wisdom in how you say it. <clears throat> but we, a person who was aware of how we're thinking would have noticed some things. Like in the first of this manuscript, I said that the, the radiometric dates would indicate that this happened, it took 12 million years. Okay, then later in the paper, I showed how it had to have been very fast. Now, somebody's paying attention, they might see, well, you know, this doesn't, there's something wrong here. <laughs> but nobody noticed it. And, and another thing I know about this manuscript, <coughs> the editor of this journal, um, um, Dr. Fastovsky, the time this happened, he had a graduate student who's a good friend of mine who was a creationist. And Fastovsky knew this guy was a creationist. They, they didn't hide anything. And Fastovsky knew about Loma Linda, and he knew that I was probably a creationist. But he didn't care. He felt the work was well done, and so he published it. And so you, there are people, there are some people out there who will try to tear you apart every chance they can, but there are decent people uh, out there, even if they don't agree, uh, they, they, um, they'll give us, a, uh, you know, they'll still publish our stuff. And this is a common experience we've had at, at Loma Linda. We have a geology program, um, biology, <coughs> and geology programs, and actually this is the only place, the only cre accredited place in the world to get a doctorate in biology or geology and study under faculty who believe the Bible. And, you know, we, many, uh, our faculty work with scientists who are not at all Bible believers. But the, the uniform experience we have is, they may think we're a little weird, but once they get to know us and what we're doing, they'll respect us, even if they don't agree. And so you use wisdom and do careful work. If we do sloppy work, God doesn't need our help. But if we do careful work, uh, we can accomplish uh, what we seek to accomplish. And <coughs> so conclusions. The numerous fossil whales are well preserved. They are not beached, but sank in shallow water. And there's nothing that would tell us there were some special conditions that would inhibit decay. Um, this preservation requires rapid burial. And the diatomite and sands and silts accumulated several orders of magnitude faster than usually believed. And our evidence supported that, and it got published. Abundant nutrients from upwelling of nutrient-rich cold water and volcanic ash um, favored these large-scale planktonic blooms. The toxic, toxic blooms and volcanic ash killed a lot of vertebrates and clams. Currents and storms brought diatoms and vertebrates towards shore concentrating them in the shallow bays. The blooms and concentration by current buried whales quickly. And this is not a unique situation. There are many places around the world at this particular place in the geologic record, we have diatoma deposits with uh, excellently preserved fossils. Most of them don't have whales, at least not very many. This is unique in having so many whales. But all of these Miocene to Pliocene diatom deposits have excellently preserved Fossils. Something unique was going on at that particular stage after the flood. Um, let's see, something got... Whoops. Something happened to one of my slides. Um, I don't know. I goofed up. Anyway, <coughs> what this all tells me is that um, we can indeed use the Bible it can give us insights that we would not have if we didn't pay attention to it. And these, in fact, work in doing research. And I, I wish I figure out what happened to that other slide because uh, this, is, this whale study is not unique. There are a number of other studies done this same way, letting the Bible open our eyes to see uh, what's there, to ask new questions. And in every case, this has resulted in... in, in, in uh, scientific understanding, improved understanding of these deposits, which in fact get published. Uh, some of those, um, 
Back in the 1970s, there was a series of studies on the Yellowstone fossil forests. <coughs> now, Dr. Chadwick was involved, and Harold Coffin, and our graduate students. Um, and that was an uh, eye-opener, uh, under new understanding of how these Yellowstone fossils got buried, and the fact that they, had to, they did not grow there, one forest after another, over many thousands of years. They were brought together and, and deposited. Another one was a, a study I did on uh, fossil turtles in Wyoming. Um, we found that th these turtles, which are in several layers in the rocks, and each one was a catastrophic mass mortality. Again, uh, rapid burial, rapid preservation. Um, <coughs> let's see. There's the, diet, the, the dino dig, which is very excellent scientific work, uh, led by Dr. Chadwick. Um, works the same way. And he just recently got a paper published describing his, his method, which is better than what other paleontologists are using. Um, let's see, what are some that I'm forgetting? Are pa paleocurrents, another work of Dr. Chadwick. And uh, there's more. Footprints. Footprints. Yeah, I, did, I studied uh, the Coconino sandstone in Arizona, which is believed by most people to be a desert deposit. Well, I studied the footprints, and now we're studying other parts of it. And the, the idea this was formed in a desert really is not working. Uh, it has to be a uh, an subaqueous deposit. So there have been many examples, and there are others that, were, that are under, underway right now. Um, <clears throat> and we, the, bio, the, the Genesis account can indeed be an asset to science. It opens our minds to see things in new ways. But then we have to use standard scientific procedures to test those ideas. And when we do that, it works. So I recommend to you the, the book of Genesis. <laughs> Thank you. Will somebody um, choose the hands that we need to speak to? I don't remember the number of species. We had them all identified, so we know what they were. There, there's a certain contingent of them that were being brought in from freshwater, you know, rivers coming in. Most of them, however, were, were deeper water diatoms that had obviously been from blooms offshore, which then were brought in by currents and, and storms into the bay. And and the, the diatoms in this whole deposit, which is, uh, you know, I don't know, a few hundred meters thick, the diatom deposits are mostly near the top. That's where this very big abundance of whales is. The whales also, though, are, are, are all the way down through, although not quite as abundant, but they're all the way down through and are equally beautifully preserved in the sandstones and siltstones. No, it's a, it's a mixture, mixture of a number of species. There were, were, there were probably a couple that were more predominant, but there was uh, a number of species. Okay, the... This this um, sort of flat flat area there it goes from from the ocean on up to about 1,500 feet. So that was under the ocean before, and as the Andes came up, it was raised enough to bring these up where we could study them. Okay, the whales, <coughs> um, they're, they're, they're in the Balanopteridae, that family. They're closely related to blue whales, but it's a, it's a, diff a little different, it's a different species. 
So this would be adaptation, speciation, um, since you know, since the beginning. There, there is all. There is also a few whales that are of a different group that are extinct, and, but most of them are related to baleen whales. No, we just notice things that, for some reason, others had not noticed. <laughs> and I, 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 our willingness to see that this maybe wasn't 12 million years uh, was certainly a, an important factor. No, we do. We didn't. There are people who will do that, but at this conference we didn't run into any of that. Well, this is that's an interesting question. In fact, we we discussed that out there with, and some of our group were not creationists at all. But um, it it so reflected the the shape of the animal. We wondered: is this the skin itself that's preserved, or is it just that the discoloration only went out about that far? Uh, we don't know the answer for sure, but it could be either one. Well, this is a, a big area of controversy in paleontology right now because the, the biochemists tell us that it can only go thousands of years. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say thousands to tens of thousands of years. Thousands to tens of thousands, but yet they're finding protein, which can be, you know, they, they use better and better methods of identifying it. Even in dinosaurs, which are supposedly 60 or more million years of old, years old, they still have this, and yet. Um, okay, so what do you do with that if you believe in the millions of years? Well, some will say, well, I've, isn't it amazing how long this can last? <laughs> and others say, well, it can't be. Something's wrong here. And so. Well, because of where they are in the record, in relation to other parts of the fossil record, we think it's it's after the flood. Now, the flood didn't just kind of all of a sudden end. It must have been you must have had a slow decrease in the amount of catastrophism. So somewhere in there, you have these these this pisco formation. At least partly. Of course, the Andes didn't come up all of a sudden, but it was certainly during that time when the Andes were rising that, that the whales were preserved. Well, um, I can't really get, name a person and say, oh, this person accepted because of what I did. But, um, but there have been cases where there's, there is acceptance. So there's this study in Yellowstone, uh, the signs along the highway told about how these, these mountains, which are layers of, of volcanic rock with these forests in them, that these were forests that grew there. <coughs> Well, as our search was proceeding, the, the, state, the park system took down those signs and put more um, just vague signs that these are preserved trees. So that was a, a success. <coughs> um, there, um, I have a, a geologist friend, an atheist geologist friend, 
who has also studied the, the sandstone with those tracks, those fossil tracks that I study. And we actually argued in the, liter in the published scientific literature about this a bit. But we've become good friends. And <clears throat> I, I ended up spending actually several days with him out in Arizona, in Utah, looking at the rocks and fossils together. And he's, an, he's still an atheist as far as I know, but he, we had a wonderful time together with him asking one question after another, including questions like, what is heaven? What is hell? What is salvation? Uh, I mean, and he was eager to talk. And we're still good friends. And you, you never know what's going to be the result of these things. So, um, and there's another, another friend when we study these uh, turtles in Wyoming. Um, one of our other Loma Linda geologists was studying the, the, the Green River Formation with all those millions of fossil fish. I was studying some distance away. And the Park Service there hired a new park paleontologist, um, Rachel. And to let her get acquainted with the area, she, they let her work with Buchheim for the summer. And part of the summer, they were all down with, with me working. And we became good friends. She'd make jokes about creationists, you know. And, um, but as the summer went on, her jokes kind of diminished. And later, she started asking questions. Do you people believe in that humans have evolved? And we said no. And like I say, we are still very good friends. And in fact, she, she had a master's degree, and she applied to Loma Linda to get a doctorate. Now, it, we didn't have the field that she wants in geology, so that didn't work out. But the fact that she, as, a, as an evolutionist, would, would, knowing us very well, would apply means something very interesting. And she made a comment once. She said, there must be a reason why I've met you people. So you never know. When we get to heaven, we'll find out what results were. But th there are, this does open people's minds. We, we know that much. There's no naive questions. Well, I'm wondering maybe you would answer the question for me. Cause I <laughs> Those are some of the questions that, w that we really hope we can find answers for at some point. Uh, why are there no whales until the upper part of the geologic column? You know, I don't know the answer. That's, that's like, why are there no humans except the upper part? Um, the, the geologic history is very complex. Um, were, were humans, for instance, living on a, pl on, a, on a continent somewhere that no longer exists? And that might sound like a really, really wild idea. But keep in mind one thing. The, the ocean floors are, are basaltic rock. The continents are, are granite. Ocean floors are basaltic rock. And you can date that rock according to the standard time scale. The ocean floors we have now, didn't, right now did not exist more than about halfway down through the geologic column. So what was, what was there in the first half? Well, we don't know. Nobody knows. Could there have been continents that don't exist? Well, there's actually evidence that indicate that might be the case. And so there's just a lot of things that we don't know that will probably keep us from fully answering those questions. But there, we've never seen a global flood. So we have nothing to go by to try to understand it. So there are a lot of questions we don't have answers for. So much what? Whales? <coughs> That's a good question too. Uh, but I, I, I can give a partial answer. Whales feed on plankton, these little things in the ocean. Okay, and, and around the coast of Peru there, you had conditions that were ideal for these plankton blooms, for so much reproduction of this plankton. You had the, the uh, nutrient-rich water coming up like it still does. Then you had the volcanic ash fertilizing all these this plankton, and that would probably bring other larger plankton uh, organisms. And I suspect the whales were gathering because there was a huge food supply here, and they were congregating here. 
And that's why there were so many. Okay, we have to separate those a little bit. Because the scavengers will take off the flesh. Um, the, the, the invertebrates will help with that, but then they'll start boring into the bones. If you have an, at least you know a year or two or more, they'll start boring holes and chewing on the bones. Well, the scavengers clearly did, did their work. They must have cleaned off a lot of flesh. But then the bones were buried before all these other creatures started boring into the bones. So the bones are, are beautiful, pristine, but a lot of the flesh was gone from scavengers, which they can do that pretty fast. We found, in a few cases, actually a shark tooth embedded into a whale bone. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, um, there's, a, there's a little complication that comes in here in, in this part. Um, could they have been dead before the flood? Well, if, it, if they're buried in the latter stages of the flood, they probably could not have been dead that long to have been buried dead before the flood. So what, why do we don't have whales buried early in the sediments in the geologic column? I don't know. But the, these it would appear that there wasn't enough time for them to have been dead that early and yet be well-preserved at, at the end of the flood. Baleen comes out of the mouth in days. There's, you certainly do have blooms, and I haven't studied the, the biology of that. So it, it certainly is possible. Um. Okay, there, there isn't a sharp boundary between real bones and petrified. These were real bones. But often fossil bones are, are real bone, but they've been... The, the little spaces in the bone had been embedded with mineral. Um, the, the turtles I studied were, were mineralized like, that way. The, the, all the spaces are filled with mineral. Um, the whales don't seem to have been like that. They, they were bone, not fully mineralized. And so you get, you get all degrees from just bone or wood to, to those that are, that are Filled with mineral to some that have been, uh, the mineral has actually replaced all of the original tissue. And it, it's, a, it's a spectrum, you, have all, you find all different kinds. We call them all fossils. Yeah. Um, there could be. It wouldn't have to be. Uh, the, the DNA is in the cells that are in the little spaces in the bone. And <clears throat> I, I actually have a bone that I brought back, um, which I'm hoping I can get somebody, some molecular biologist to study. Because <laughs> in dinosaur bones, they find the, the tissue in, inside the bone. And so it can be there. And there could be in some of these whales. And we know that there is some actual protein. Um, nobody has looked for DNA yet, but it, it could be. No, carbon dating, 
if you look at the geologic column, you got the standard scale. You go from 541 million years to, to now. Okay, carbon dating can only work, even on that time scale, down to 45 or 50,000 years. And that, that's way too short a time for the whales. They, they, they are believed to be like 12 million. So carbon dating is, is only useful for, for the very surface deposits. But but interesting thing, people who study, creationists who study carbon dating have taken these very ancient materials which, which should not have any carbon-14 and they find that there is a small amount. And so they and the people who do their dating, they argue about this, is that contamination or what is it? But it, it's, it's possible that there is a little carbon-14 which says it can't be millions of years old. So that's a whole other interesting question. Um, we haven't personally done. There, there is work being done, and it's, 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 there's a lot of interesting fossil whales. There are, <coughs> there are uh, several kinds of extinct ones, and there, there are those who want the whales to have evolved. They take certain land-dwelling creatures and, and make a sequence they, they're claiming is the evolution of whales. You can argue about that. Um, one one thing is that there's a there's a, a genuine aquatic whale fossil that appears to be as old as the, all those intermediates so-called intermediates. So um, um, I'm doubtful about whale evolution. I couldn't prove it to you. 